This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. Two that you might like are A Companion to Marx's Capital, The Complete Edition, and The Limits to Capital, which are both by David Harvey and out in new editions. For nearly 40 years, David Harvey has written and lectured on capital, becoming one of the world's foremost Marxist scholars. Based on his lectures, this volume, bringing together his guides to volumes 1, 2, and much of 3, presents this depth of learning to a broader audience, guiding first-time readers through a fascinating and deeply rewarding text. A companion to Marx's capital offers fresh, original, and sometimes critical interpretations of a book that changed the course of history and, as Harvey intimates, may do so again. Now a classic of Marxian economics, The Limits to Capital provides one of the best theoretical guides to the history and geography of capitalist development. In this edition, Harvey updates his seminal text with a substantial discussion of the turmoil in world markets today. Delving into concepts such as fictitious capital and uneven geographical development, Harvey takes the reader step by step through layers of crisis formation, beginning with Marx's controversial argument concerning the falling rate of profit, and closing with a timely foray into the geopolitical and geographical implications of Marx's work. A companion to Marx's capital, the complete edition, and the limits to capital, are both by David Harvey and out now in new editions from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm temporarily broadcasting from Santiago de Chile. My guest today is longtime organizer Jonathan Matthew Smucker, the author of Hegemony How-To, A Roadmap for Radicals. The book is both a critique of the radical left's traditional style of politics and a how-to guide to fighting and winning, from nuts and bolts organizing methods to theory. The left politics that Smucker takes issue with is one that for decades took comfort and even pride in its own marginality, and that substituted tactics for strategy even while it nurtured a sense of strong therapeutic community for people who were understandably disgusted by and alienated from a society where neoliberalism and empire seemed permanent. The picture Smucker paints is a familiar one to me. I joined the left as a high school student in the late 1990s, and for me, movement life was, amongst other things, a way to sublimate my own juvenile delinquency into political subversion. As a young activist, I waged a lot of important fights against sweatshops and war and for immigrant rights, but too often we were defined by a pessimistic fatalism, if for understandable reasons, given the conditions that we were operating under. Thankfully, however, those conditions have changed, and partly as a result, the form of politics that Smucker critiques have, since he wrote the book a few years ago, been supplanted by struggles that aim to win have a plan to win, and are winning. We cover a lot of ground in this interview, but one thing that we didn't have the time to discuss as much as I would have liked is Smucker's argument that left organizers need to not only convince people that the issues on which we are asking them to take action are morally urgent, but also that the actions are themselves politically efficacious. And one important point that Smucker makes in his book is that a case in point of the appearance of efficacy being so important in convincing sympathetic people to take action was the huge volunteer mobilization for Bernie 2016. He writes that, in general, electoral campaigns often have the capacity to mobilize huge numbers of people. And fast. Some radicals, Smucker writes, often complain that electoral campaigns divert energy from other organizing. But he argues that this is wrong. In reality, he writes, successful electoral campaigns aren't distracting people from political work they would have otherwise been doing. Rather, he argues, successful campaigns are tapping into energies that had only been potential before because they had not been activated by other organizations. I think that's mostly right. 
But I would add a bit more. First, we do have a larger problem in this country of reducing politics to electoral races. But that's a problem of mainstream political culture exacerbated by mainstream media that ignores left organizing until and unless it becomes impossible to do so. What's more, individual organizations like DSA do have concrete decisions to make about how to approach the Bernie campaign in terms of their time and resources. But my take is that grassroots organizers and the Bernie campaign alike can make concrete decisions that make this a lot less of a trade-off. If the Bernie campaign can speak to existing grassroots campaigns for things like housing and utilities justice and everything else you all are fighting for on the ground, then both local organizations and the Bernie campaign can use this campaign to both win the election and to build the powerful organizations for change that will be necessary to advance our local and state-level campaigns. Plus, these are the sorts of powerful independent organizations that we will need to both hold a Sanders presidency accountable and fight on its behalf against enemies from both major parties in Congress. Okay, that's what I think about that. But before we get started, I need to ask you for money. This podcast is possible because you... Our dedicated listeners support us at patreon.com slash the dig. If you contribute $5 a month, you get access to our newsletter, the most recent being authored by NACLA, an indispensable source of left-wing news on the Americas. $10 a month gets you either a copy of Jacobin's ABCs of Socialism, Assad Hater's Mistaken Identity, or Feminism for the 99%, A Manifesto, by Cynthia Arutza, Tithi Bhattacharya, and Nancy Fraser. Contribute $20 or more and we'll send you a box of left-wing books. So, please, contribute what you can now at patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. I also just wanted to give you a heads up about some of my upcoming episodes. I've got Tithi Bhattacharya on Feminism for the 99%, Mohammed Mahmoud Ul Muhammadu on ISIS, Greg Grandin on The End of the Myth, Jenny Chan on Labor Struggles in China, Sylvia Federici on Caliban and the Witch, and Communist Chilean Mayor Daniel Haudwe. I'm also setting up an interview on Chile's powerful feminist movement. More on that soon. Many thanks. And here's Jonathan Matthew Smucker, the co-founder and executive director of Beyond the Choir and co-founder of Lancaster Stands Up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jonathan has worked for more than two decades in grassroots movements as an organizer, campaigner, and strategist, and he researches collective identity, populism, and political realignment processes as the focus of his doctoral work in the sociology department at UC Berkeley. And he is, of course, the author of Hegemony How-To, A Roadmap for Radicals, which is published by AK Press. Quick note, we had a bit of a tech problem, and so you'll hear the audio quality suddenly get a bunch better around the end of his first answer. Jonathan Matthew Smucker, welcome to The Dig. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Your book opens with a critique of movement culture, at least as it existed for a long time until recently, as often insular and self-marginalizing. But at the same time, you believe that movement culture is indispensable. You found a home in left politics and were able to develop an identity and ideology distinct from the conservative one that you were raised within as a Pennsylvania Mennonite. You write, quote, The movement reminded me a lot of church. Going to a protest felt a lot like a worship service. Getting arrested for civil disobedience was something like baptism, a rite of passage, an assertion of one's rightful place in the group. And so there lies the double-edged sword you identify. Community often also brings this incredible insularity and marginality. Everyone said they were part of a movement, but you asked, quote, where is this movement? Show me something that fits the minimum requirements of what most people mean by the term movement. Where were the masses of people in motion to advance any of our causes? So to start, say a little bit about how you entered the left, what it meant to you, and how you came to realize its shortcomings. 
so my path into uh, the left or progressive social movements uh, is not, maybe it's not the most rare, but it, it's certainly not typical. Um, I was raised rural, conservative, working class, very religious, outside of a little town called Bird in Hand. And uh, so I'm not really a usual suspect. There's a lot of particulars about, you know, things I can identify of like, oh, that was a key moment, um, you know, getting into that rock band that was, you know, involved in, you know, political issues or a couple things in particular, the racism at my high school and uh, how it led me to have a lot of questions and to have a political analysis looking at how my school administration uh, treated different people differently based on race in that situation. And there's other things I've pointed to in the past, like reading the Bible for the first time for myself and seeing how much in it was about social justice, economic justice, um, really at the heart of it, and and that leading me to a lot of questions. But it really all comes down to, I feel like it was a series of accidents, kind of random encounters that kind of set me on this path. And that's been important to me because I've always since the time I was 15, 16, and started to become politicized, had this conviction that I was not so different than other people around me. And that it was, you know, just particular moments that changed my thinking that led me on this path. And that's been important to me because it's, you know, as I've dived into lefty subcultures pretty deep for a while. You know, when people talk about rural areas of America, areas like where I'm from, I've always had the feeling that I'm not so different from the other people around me. And that if we provided more opportunities for more people, maybe we could be organizing in areas like this where where progressive forces used to organize. And if you could say a little bit about how you came to realize the shortcomings of this community that did offer you so many concrete benefits? When I first started organizing, it was here in Lancaster County. And the first thing I started doing was organizing against Walmart coming into the area. I was 17. I organized people around me to take part in it. We organized protests against the Walmart and kind of a mini campaign. I didn't really know what a campaign was. Um, And so it was meaningful, but it was really hard because I didn't really have peers and I didn't have mentors and I felt like I was reinventing the wheel. When I got turned on to the Catholic worker movement and then ended up moving to the Washington, D.C., Dorothy Dayhouse Catholic worker soon after high school, I found a deep sense of community and I didn't have to invent everything from scratch. I, I found this sense of belonging and the sense of like shared values um, and like you you said in the quote that you read, uh, it, I felt like I found my church. Um, it felt familiar in that way, um, very much like my religious upbringing. Um, and that was valuable. It was meaningful and, um, you know, psychologically and in terms of community, I found a lot of what fed me. But immediately I had questions about how effective we were. The community I was part of had a weekly vigil at the Pentagon and... You know, they would sing anti-war songs and hold signs every Monday morning. We did a lot of other resistance to militarism type of public demonstrations and work. And it didn't seem tied to any strategy and it didn't seem tied to any significant social base of people that was going to make a difference in terms of how the people in power, whether they had any incentive to do any of the things that we wanted them to do. And that was pretty obvious to me from day one. But sometimes I would kind of suspend that doubt because I was getting so much out of it. I was 18 years old. I felt a deep sense of community and meaning. Um, and so that that kind of dilemma was present in my mind from day one. And particularly in that community, um, which was uh, the Atlantic Life community, the Catholic worker uh, movement where people talked explicitly about not being concerned about effectiveness. They talked in a very religious language about, you know, being faithful. Uh, they talk, They use the language of witness, of moral witness. It's more of a prophetic sensibility. Yeah, and they, they were very clear about that and where they stood. Um, and I never felt good about that because I I felt that we had to 
take responsibility not just for, you know, washing our hands of the injustices that were happening, but doing our best to figure out a strategy to actually make the biggest impact that we could. And so that's some of what I wrestled with. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it, it, it took me a, a few years within the left or what there was of a left then in the mid 90s for me to develop a bit more of a deeper analysis and, and some of what you read in Hegemony How To about understanding that those limitations. You, you mentioned, I use the phrase double-edged sword. Um, I call it the political identity paradox. Um, it's a nerdy way of talking about it, but it's the paradox that solidarity and sense of belonging and community is really the lifeblood of social movements. You cannot have the kind of commitment, people working long hours, people uh, risking prison, risking their safety, the risks and the time commitments that successful social movements demand. You can't have that without having a deep sense of solidarity and community. Um, so it's the lifeblood of social movements. But the problem is that that sense of belonging and solidarity tends to construct barriers between participants in movements and the broader society. And especially movements, when they get into oppositional struggle, there is there are social incentives for kind of exaggerating differences between society and and gravitating toward um, you know bonding within the group uh, at the expense of bridging and connecting with broader uh, broader movements and not just broader movements, but you know sympathetic audiences. The way you describe this dynamic is a tension between what you call the life of the group, its inward-looking internal dynamics, and that group's political efficacy, which is something that is necessarily dependent on looking and acting outward beyond the group. You know, take another kind of group uh, that you might bond over. Like, let's say you are part of a rugby team and you have a subculture around playing lots of rugby with your rugby team, right? Right. Great. As rugby you know, players do. <laughs> as rugby players do, right? Um, so you you bond with other people, you develop, you know, your own meanings and jargon that bonds you to the group. And there's a technical aspect too, right? Like you have to have all this technical ways of talking about rugby that most people in society have no idea what you're talking about and they don't need to know what you're talking about. Fine, you bond with that group and you get to play more rugby and you get to orient your life around something you love to do. Uh, you could do that with, let's say, World of Warcraft or a Sewing Circle, right? All sorts of things. However, in, in politics, if you just surround yourself with other people who are into, you know, this thing called activism and it assumes this kind of niche identity, well, that's a problem because to have any power in the political terrain you actually have to align with much larger forces than a small community of self-selectors. And that's kind of the structural dilemma that we're in today. I do talk about this in the book, that, that some of this has to do with the rise of neoliberalism and the way that uh, it has structured society where we, we do gravitate into these little niches, these little pockets of self-selectors. And Activism itself has become this little niche of self-selectors. Yeah, you, you you identify the the very identity of activists as part of this separation of the left from broader society, and and that identity you found is a rather new one. You dug up some fascinating data showing that the term really exploded in the eighties and nineties, which is tellingly, of course, a period dominated by the rise of neoliberalism and the historic defeat of the left. And you write that in, in contrast to terms like abolitionist, populist, suffragette, unionist, or socialist, that activists references no specific ideological content at all, but rather just the fact that the activist is implicitly, unlike the median person, politically active. It's like, she's a chess player. I'm an activist. It's the identity of a hobbyist, you write. And, and making matters worse, it's an identity that has been effectively demonized for decades. Yeah, that's right. I basically take the word, the label activist, and we look back in history and we think, oh, suffragettes or abolitionists, they were activists, but literally they didn't have that word. It didn't exist. Um, it didn't come into its, its it, it wasn't coined in its current usage until 
uh, the late 1950s, 1960s, and it didn't really start to be used until the 70s and then really took off in the 80s and 90s, like you said. And um, so, you know, the arg- the counter argument would be, well, so what? There's a new term for an old phenomenon. Weren't they activists, the suffragettes, the unionists, uh, the populists, et cetera? And my argument is no, they weren't. <laughs> that, that there's some things in that term that those categories overlapped with, but that there's something distinct and separate uh, from from those terms that is new and is detrimental. And the main thing is that it's it's now a hobby, uh, like you said, a chess player or a golfer. You know, it's like, uh, oh, you're an activist. Oh, that's nice. Have fun at your protest on Saturday. That's what activists do. And I'm going to hit the golf course on Saturday because I'm a golfer and that's what I do. You do you, I do me. And like you said, uh, it holds a different content you know, terms like socialist or abolitionist held a content. It's not that these terms weren't polarizing, but that polarization was a fight over content and the direction of the society, whereas activist is now just this generic label that stands in the way of, you know, people are like, oh, well, I'm not an activist. Therefore, the things I care about, I care about racism or I care about the environment, but I'm not an activist. So this generic label that has no content kind of stands in the way of somebody who cares about an issue and then taking action on that issue. You argue that part and parcel of this activist identity is politics as self-expression. And you recount your experience in the direct action working group for the 2000 A16 protests against the IMF and World Bank, which were these historically huge, one of the historically huge mass mobilizations of the turn of the century anti-globalization movement. And you write that the group spent half of its meeting time for five weeks straight debating how to phrase a mission statement. You write, quote, the mission statement was contentious because it was an expression of our identity and was qualitatively different than navigating and negotiating legitimate disagreements over political goals or strategies and tactics for their achievement. Explain what happened in this working group and your argument about how the concern for expressing who we are can crowd out a focus on what we want to accomplish. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to approach this question. One aspect of it is that the left has become, uh, and I think this is changing over the past two years, but in the milieu that I kind of discovered the left in in the '90s and 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 for you know two decades, uh, the left had become so unaccustomed to having any power that we gravitated much more toward self-expression and toward a purist politics. Uh, because if you can't make a change, the next best thing is to be righteous. There's another element of this that I get into some in the book, um, but I've developed a a lot more since in the two years uh, since the book came out. And that is the the kind of how this phenomenon of the rise of self-expressive politics is related to economic class and related to the burgeoning of the middle class post-World War II in the United States. You cite cite Hopper Moss's observations. Yeah, Habermas, I bring in Englehart a bit, um, and and even like some old Reisman, uh, because he was more um, predictive in this uh, in, in much earlier works. Uh, but the basic argument is that, I mean, Englehart took Maslow's hierarchy of needs and basically says that, you know, the further up you are, once you're, you know, once you've got breathing and warmth and <laughs> food and basic material needs taken for granted— you can then uh, spend more of your time thinking about identity, self-expression, um, you know, this expansive way of being, which is great. You know, I mean, it's 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 great to have those material needs taken for granted. But one of the results of this is that politics has become the good news of this is politics has become much less class reductionist. Um, politics has, you know, there are there there's an expansionary politics that you see in the 80s. I mean, sorry, in the in the post 1968, um, where not only racial justice but gender justice, uh, LGBTQ movements, the environmental movement, a lot of different movements start to arise that are not just reducible to economic class. That's one of the good pieces of this. 
one of the negative pieces is that um, for a lot of people who grew up comfortable and with a lot of economic privilege, the movement's success becomes less do or die. And the motivation for a lot of people becomes much more self-expressive than having to win because you're tied to a community that whose survival is in struggle. So there's there's a lot less of a tie to in political struggle to like, you know, we need to win this or else we're in trouble. And much more of this kind of politics of self-expression. And that's one of the most important aspects of my political work in the past several years has been working with groups to understand the class-based insularity in the political leadership in the United States. And this isn't limited to the left. We talk about a political class that's emerged that has separated itself from working class people. Um, And you have different iterations of this. Um, Different people have discussed this, this book, uh, uh, Opportunity Hoarders. I'm forgetting the author's name, Greer. But uh, where he looks at how the top 20% in the economic spectrum has become, uh, has been guarding its economic privilege from school districts to real estate, et cetera. And one of the things that I've looked at is how that plays out in the political realm and how the political leadership in the country, not just the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but also um, social movements and radical movements um, that most of the leadership is concentrated within the top 10, 10 to 20 percent of the economic spectrum and has lost touch with the working class um, with working class culture. So that's a lot of where this comes from, in my opinion, is becoming out of touch with with everyday working people. And that's why that's part of why you can spend so much time refining a short mission statement instead of thinking about how you're going to talk to a person at the door. It's a matter of who your reference points are on on some level. And you write that, ironically, the phrase, the personal is political, has come to mean precisely the opposite of what it initially was intended to convey. It wasn't supposed to mean that your consumer choices are political action or that you're mission statement is political action. What it was meant to mean, you write, is that the problems facing us as individuals, families, and communities are also, in fact, deeply political. It's, you write, what Black Lives Matter has done by identifying the murder of an individual black person as part of a pattern, or the notion that foreclosure is not a personal failing, but rather the manifestation of systemic capitalist brutality. Right. So let's take that latter example, the the foreclosure crisis, when millions of people were facing foreclosure or um, or were underwater in their, their mortgages. And there's a tendency to look at that as a personal problem, for people to see that as their own personal problem, their own personal shortcoming. And part of the politicization, making the personal political, as the expression goes, was getting individual homeowners and communities to see that there were culprits in this crisis, that there were millions of other people just like you. And so the problem was structured, uh, it was structural, and the solutions were collective. They were not just saving individual homes or individuals navigating their circumstances, but individuals coming together communities coming together and building political power to intervene to save homes and to change a housing policy, which the movement Occupy Homes or Occupy Our Homes came up as, you know, in the in the wake of Occupy Wall Street. That was one movement uh, set to addressing that. But this expression, the personal is political, has come to mean the opposite of what it was intended to mean initially. And it's come to mean like, if I take personal action as an individual, in my consumer choices, or just, you know, even just me participating in a protest as an individual, that individual action is a political action. And it's very, it's kind of been inverted. And that's a product of the individualistic culture that we have um, that's arisen in the past 40 years as a product of neoliberalism. What do you make of what's happening now with the identity activist for many in the years since you wrote your book being supplanted by that of socialist? People have embraced socialist, it seems to me, precisely because, unlike activist, it denotes a comprehensive worldview. And alongside that, its sudden and very rapid emergence has also, no doubt, had a huge impact on the national political debate. 
that's my specific question. My general question is, in, in some ways, I hope that your book is a bit of an obituary for the radical left as it was. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. It's no small irony to me that I submitted the the final revisions of my book on November 8th, 2016. I, I do think that there have been big, big changes. I mean, Trump's election. I mean, the, the two biggest changes or causes for changes in the dominant culture about politics and also within, you know, what we might call left are, in my opinion, Bernie Sanders primary in 2016 and uh, Trump's election in 2016. I think that there was a moment somewhere in March, there was a period over about three weeks in March of 2016, when suddenly it became clear to a lot of people that Bernie Sanders was a serious candidate. And I think it was a shock, not just to the dominant culture, but also to the left itself, because people had underestimated not only Bernie Sanders, but what he symbolized. And that was the possibility of a bottom-up politics and a politics that took on the consolidation of, of wealth and political power in a serious way and, and, and named corporates, the billionaire class, the political class, uh, Wall Street, that that politics could be a serious politics in America today. It was a really interesting moment in terms of, for me, uh, being somebody who has traversed quite a lot of terrain in the left. You know, I've I've been involved in radical social movements, Earth First, the American Indian Movement, the Catholic Worker Movement, and then I've you know I've worked for Move On um, and been involved in more mainstream electoral politics. There was kind of like a double litmus test in those weeks. The one was like. All my more radical friends who are totally allergic to anything to do with electoral politics, <laughs> like like some of them were suddenly like, okay, game on, we can do this, right? And then others were like, their their purism and their attachment to that kind of purism became clear because there was suddenly an opportunity and they decided not to take it. And those are, you know, fun people who maybe I'll have a beer with, but I'm not going to take seriously politically anymore. Um and then there was the other litmus test of the more liberal folks who um, suddenly, um, you know, folks who had worked within the Democratic Party or in relationship to the Democratic Party, who were either like, you know, either got the intervention that Bernie was making on class politics or didn't. And the people who didn't were often the same people that scolded the radical left for years for supporting, let's say, Nader's 2000 candidacy for spoiling it. And then... Bernie 2016 sort of called their bluff and was like, okay, we're doing it inside the Democratic Party, which is what you always wanted, right? That's right. And they're like, oh, no, no, not that. Yeah. Uh, so that was the one big change. And then the other change was, of course, Trump's election and scaring a lot of people into action. And so, you know, you have now, uh, I think, immediately following the 2016 election, uh, objectively, the biggest opportunity for grassroots organizing that uh, we've ever seen in our lifetime in terms of just millions of people chomping at the bit, wanting to get involved. And then the, the big problem is that comes at a moment where we're at the tail end of a long period of decline in infrastructure and just the basic skills of democracy, knowing how to organize, knowing how to like facilitate a meeting, how to do promotion to get people to turn out for something. Those basic like skills of democracy, those muscles have atrophied. I think that's Theta Scotchpole's terms. And so we're in a position where a lot of people want to get involved, but we have not been equipped with the organizing know-how and the kind of bench of leadership to um, absorb uh, all that potential energy and to turn it into sustained action. It's not just that everyone all of a sudden is becoming a socialist, though some people are. It, it's precisely its denotive properties of, of, of there being a content that seems to motivate people in embracing this label. I think that's right. I think it's a very positive development. Um, you know, I myself am a proud member of, of DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. What I think still holds true from my warning or critique is that the tendency to make these labels kind of contract into a miniaturism or into a small club is still alive and well <laughs> and uh, and plaguing a lot of DSA chapters and a lot of different you know groups in the left today. It's certainly present in in you know what people refer to as left Twitter. 
I think it's true that the, the label socialist or the label democratic socialist carries much more of a, a content, a political content than the label activist. However, um, it's also a very demonized term. And unless you're doing the work to make that term mean what it needs needs to mean. And posting is not working. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you, you've you got it right. I mean, you've got to translate these terms and make them meaningful to people at the door in the communities where we need to build power. And we can't be so attached to these specific terms that we forget that. And even terms like Green New Deal and Medicare for All, which are intended to carry meaning, and I think, you know, do carry a lot of meaning, we still have to work constantly to make sure that those terms are carrying the intended meaning that we have with them, and to recognize that our opponents are trying to brand those things in a different way. We have to have communication strategies and organizing strategies to make sure that um, we're translating those meanings and that we are, that our reference points are the broader bases of people that we need to bring in to any successful political project, as opposed to the kind of center of a small insular uh, lefty culture. Let's turn to the how to do this part of your book. You write, quote, knowledge of what is wrong with a social system and knowledge about how to change the system are two completely different categories of knowledge. And you cite Gramsci's line that, quote, the attribute utopian does not apply to political will in general, but to specific wills which are incapable of relating means to ends and hence are not even wills, but idle whims, dreams, longings, etc. Explain these two categories of knowledge, because this is really fundamental to the argument of your book, and why it is that the left has been drawn to the mistaken belief that critiquing and transforming reality are one and the same. Most political books or political articles are not about how to do politics. They're not about how to build, how to wield power, how to navigate the terrain of political power. They're about an issue or a set of issues. There's policy articles or policy books about you know breaking down why this policy matters and why we should go in this direction or that direction. And there's political analysis articles. But uh, until recently, really the past two years, there has not been much of a genre for a few decades of writing about how to build political power, how to navigate political terrain. Now there, you know, there's a number of books that came out along with mine, uh, like Rules for Revolutionaries, you know, When We Fight, We Win, uh, the Angler Brothers book, This is an Uprising, there's, there's uh, Jane McAlevey's book. You know, there's a number of books now that are in this genre of navigating political terrain, building political power at the grassroots level. And that's a good sign. That's a good thing because us not having that vocabulary has made us kind of, you know, a clubhouse on the sidelines, you know, that armchair revolutionary, you know, pick your term. Um, we've become used to having very robust analytical critiques of what's wrong with capitalism, what's wrong with U.S. politics, but really not having any kind of vocabulary of how to move from point A to point B, point A being where we are um, in this moment in American politics and culture to where we want to go in terms of the policies and the structures that we want to see in the world. It turns out, unfortunately, that we've all just been podcasters all along. <laughs> right. You know, and, <laughs> and you know, I think there's a lot of things that go into this. Some of it is just, you know, being so shut out of U.S. politics for a period of 40 years. You know, the trauma of the rise of Reaganism and the cultural backlash the attacks on organized labor and the kind of shrinking of the left into the NGO world of small nonprofits that don't have bases and that just have to try to do what they can on single issues and then radical quote unquote social movements that tend to be, you know, much smaller than what meets the most people's definition of a social movement. So we become so used to not having power that the allure of having the most refined critique um, is is pretty great, that that's kind of like what we've learned how to do. And I think this is especially true maybe for people like me and like you who came of age as left activists in the late 90s and got that first Howard Zinn book or Noam Chomsky 
article or, you know, first plugged into indie media and felt like we were being initiated into a group that had the correct knowledge that had been obscured ever and censored everywhere else. I think that's right. And I think today one of the 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 structures that is perpetuating this the most is social media. Now, I'm not like a Luddite, and I think that social media has a lot of value for mobilizing. I use it. Um, but I think it's creating a lot of really bad incentives in terms of organizing and building power. Um, you know, Zainab Tefechi has talked about this um, at length. She, she talks about the, the economy of attention, where if you put tons of effort into building power behind the scenes – it's no longer translating into into social capital in you know quote unquote the left, but if you spend a lot of time doing self promotion on Twitter, and you know that is turning into social capital within social movements, and so you kind of have uh, this dynamic of the workhorses and the show horses, um, where you know I mean this played out in Occupy Wall Street. A lot of us who were just doing tons of work behind the scenes. Um, didn't have a lot of social capital in relationship to left Twitter um, because we weren't putting time into that. Uh, but then you had people who spent all their time doing self-promotion and doing, um, you know, just being on social media and attending to that. Um, so I think social media is perpetuating this and we have to really be careful of that right now. And it what it does is it incentivizes having like the hot take or having the most, you know, woke analysis as opposed to gaining the kind of skills that we need that build our capacity as movements, you know, kind of mundane things of like, you know, how to write a press release, how to go door to door, how to organize a canvas. And those are the skills that we really de- how to run a campaign, how to run for office, right? There's an enormous amount of technical expertise that goes into these things that is invisible, that's behind the scenes. And there aren't enough people who know how to do it, and there's not much of an incentive for people to learn how to do this stuff. Um, so that's one of the things that we have to figure out uh, how to how to kind of how to change. Um, and I think we're we're getting there. You know, like more people are learning how to run campaigns, more people are learning how to run for office. But we have a huge, huge deficit to make up. I mean, in my opinion, we need 30, 40 um Ocasio Cortez's in the 2020 election and in, in House races, in or if we're to gain the the momentum that undermines the the momentum of Trump's authoritarian populism. Along these lines, you write, "quote Powerful political challengers have never built their operations entirely from scratch, but rather by means of politicizing, activating, and aligning existing social blocks and institutions." You continue, "quote." When activists enter a special cultural space where activism takes place among like-minded activists, what happens is that some of the most idealistic and collectively-minded young people in society remove themselves voluntarily from the institutions and social networks that they were organically positioned to influence and contest. Our work is, rather, to contribute to the politicization of presently depoliticized everyday spaces, to weave politics and collective action into the fabric of society. And you point to the history of the religious right since the 1980s, which, learning from the Black Civil Rights Movement, activated the potential political power of already existing churches into this powerful political force. And you contrast that to what happened on the left and amongst liberals during that same period. Liberals created single-issue 501c3 groups with paper memberships, whose primary role was making donations to sustain the organization, while the radical left, as we've discussed, quote, imploded and contracted. Explain your argument here and which existing social blocks you think the left should be prioritizing today. It's a hard question, to be honest. To me, this question isn't, it is about our orientation as opposed to a dogmatic prescription of like, we need to organize this community or that community. Within the argument that I make, I also talk about block, what's called block recruitment specifically. So that's like, instead of just forming an organization, you're recruiting like the civil rights movement did, whole congregations and denominations suddenly found themselves aligned and bought into um, this thing called the civil rights movement. And then suddenly you have 
all of the resources in those existing institutions going to bat for movement ends. Um, so you have a, a dramatic increase in the capacity of that movement, which is very different than a movement trying to build all of its own organizational capacity from scratch in a single organization. And yes, I say that the, the Christian right studied the civil rights movement and emulated it. And there are huge consequences to that politically today. Some of this, there's an orientation piece. It's like the right has claimed God and country and the left has often been like, well, yeah, sure, you can have it. Um, that's been really detrimental. What I'm not saying is that we don't need to build our own distinct political organizations, because I think we do, right? We definitely need organizations that are whose purpose is political, right? Membership organizations, uh, organizations that are intervening in politics on issue campaigns and in electoral politics. But their orientation can't just be to build from scratch. It has to be to meet existing social blocks where they are. Um, that's going to look different in different ways. In a lot of ways, this is speaking much more just to having an outward orientation as opposed to being content with the self-selectors who show up. And the specific blocks to be identified would depend on, you know, just a huge number of particular contexts that all of the various organizers listening to the show might be living and working within. Yeah. So let's move out of the idea of block recruitment for just a second. And let's take uh, a tactic that is very ripe for electoral organizing and also issue organizing. And that is door to door, going door to door, talking to neighbors, having conversations, you know, getting them to join your organization or getting them to vote, uh, uh, per, you know, persuasion. So this is different than block recruitment, but it's really, uh, you know, if you're going out and talking to people door to door in a community, that means you're not just sitting and talking to people who already think like you. I actually think this particular tactic, I, I don't think any tactic is like a, a magic bullet, but this particular tactic I think is really, really important for getting progressive groups to not be insular, whether that's like a liberal kind of like indivisible group or a DSA group or whatever it is, going out and talking to people at the door changes your point of reference. And so, you know, one of the ways I talk about um, the, the solution to the, the political identity paradox, which we talked about earlier, in my opinion, is that the role of leaders in a social movement is to make sure that the things that bond you to the group, that make you feel like you're part of this distinct community, that those things also help you connect with a broader base. And that's a hard thing to do, but canvassing is kind of a particular, going door to door is a particular uh, way that that can be done. So you kind of frame the hardcore thing to do to become part of the group, to like show that you belong to, to the group, is to go out and talk to everyday working class people who you don't know how to talk to at first and to mess up and to learn how to do it. Rather than what was the most hardcore thing for us to do as young leftists in the late 90s, I could not wait to get arrested for civil disobedience and to get exactly beat by the police, <laughs> both of which happened to me at a pretty young age. <laughs> it's same, exactly, right? And it's not to say that there's never a place for that. Um, this isn't about one tactic is better than another tactic inherently, but this is that, um, you know, all tactics should be about political escalation. And political escalation is different than a lot of the ways that we've been taught about escalation. Like you might think escalation is writing a letter to the editor and then going to a protest and then getting arrested. That is escalation in a certain regard, but it's not inherently political escalation. Political escalation is escalating the costs that your opponents uh, and the risks your opponents are facing and the, you know, escalating the incentive they have to either capitulate or your ability to uh, to win power. And so you do that by moving a bigger base. There might be, you know, tactical ex escalations, you know, like having a, a thousand people willing to risk arrest probably is an escalation of a thousand people willing to write a letter to the editor. But having a thousand people willing to go door to door and talk to their neighbors 10 people risking arrest is not an escalation politically from that. Um, so again, yeah, exactly. The, the role of leaders is to 
you know, kind of design campaigns that get the core of the participants, you know, oriented to the base that they need to bring into political action. And canvassing is a really, really, going door to door is a really, really good tactic for that. I mean, just like in Lancaster over the past uh, two years, I mean, we've knocked between the Just King for Congress campaign and Lancaster Stands Up, we knocked nearly 250,000 doors. We we made over a million calls. Um, and uh, what this did is it helped us organize a, a formidable base in a place where there hadn't been a progressive base like this organized previously. Um, but it also oriented those initial self-selecting leaders um, to the base that we need to be organizing. So it oriented those leaders to have the right reference points. And it changed, you know, even my orientation, you know, like I was very aware of this problem of insularity in the left. You know, we have over a thousand dues paying members now who are part of Lancaster Stands Up. We estimate more than two thirds of them were not politically active besides maybe voting, some of them not even that, prior to the 2016 election. When you're involved in a political project that is bringing that many people who were not involved in politics, who had no sense of political agency into a political vehicle where they do have a sense of political agency, that really becomes the only thing that matters. Your conversations at the door or in big town hall meetings become your primary reference points. And you really start to to give two fucks about whether or not your super woke friends are like liking your status on Facebook or <laughs> retweeting you, you know, that fades as a reference point. You, you really don't care. And you start to realize like, wow, that is an insular world. And I don't care if I'm in the middle of that conversation. To do all of this, you write, we need to think of people outside the left differently. People in the left need to think about those who are currently outside the left differently. And the task of organizers, you write, is to look for cracks in hegemony everywhere. And you cite this line from Paulo Freire, the Brazilian author of Pedagogy of the Oppressed, quote, Sometimes, in our uncritical understanding of the nature of the struggle, we can be led to believe that all the everyday life of the people is a mere reproduction of the dominant ideology. But it is not. There will always be something of the dominant ideology in the cultural expressions of the people. But there is also, in contradiction to it, the signs of resistance. In the language, in music, in food preferences, in popular religion, in their understanding of the world. Sometimes on the left, there's, there's this aversion to people who aren't already political or who may even have some bad ideas in their head. But you argue that we have to meet people where they're at. What does that look like? I mean, it looks like going door to door. It looks like engaging with communities as they are. And it doesn't mean not not having a politics and not pushing people and not doing deeper political education. I mean, Frary, who I love, he criticizes what he calls the banking model of education, right? Where the idea in a lot of school systems that, that, that the teacher is the expert and they download their expertise into the student's head, like as like as one makes a deposit into a bank. You know, his argument is that rather, you know, the teacher, the educator, first of all, has something to learn as well as something to teach. And it's about creating experiences that allow people to critically reflect on their own experience of the world in order to build an analysis. So it recognizes that political analysis people have to own by by building it themselves. You can't download it into people's heads. So I think it's in chapter six of my book, I talk about the pedagogy of a campaign. And that is basically understanding that analysis is built over time and that we intervene, we can create um, experiences that, that allow people to make sense of unfolding events, of news, that we you know can have this protest and this campaign and this door knocking campaign and um, this mass meeting. And through those experiences, people formulate an analysis. And so when you understand that, you become much less concerned with this idea that you have to say all of the radical things in your analysis in every moment in order to not be watering things down or selling out or whatever, because you recognize that Politics and deepening people's political analysis is about creating space. 
it doesn't mean you never have, you know, a book reading club or a deeper workshop around, you know, like understanding something like racialized capitalism. It just means that you understand that you don't do all of the things all at once in every moment. Which is why communist parties used to understand this. You have you have party newspapers, you have party leaflets, and you have party journals. And they're different things, speaking to different audiences with people at different levels of involvement in the organization. Sure. And you have like branches of people where they don't use the words communist or socialist because they recognize the the conditions where they're organizing. Yeah. It, it's and, and this is what we find at the door, right? When we go to the door, people have complex politics. They have different views on different issues. They have different stories and values that often might seem to somebody who is constantly paying attention to politics and who has a you know a more refined political analysis like they're just full of contradictions and but people are complex yeah that that is something that's so obscured by the way political media mediates the mass of ordinary people's political opinions people do not fit often into neat left, right, and center. People have incredibly idiosyncratic beliefs about how the world works often. They do. And, you know, this is the biggest thing that we've taken into our door knocking operation in Lancaster, um, Pennsylvania, over the past two years, is that we have taken pains to avoid words like left, like liberal, like Democrat, and also kind of trite frames um, that like gun control, phrases like gun control. It's not that we're not talking about the issues or avoiding issue fights. It's that we're avoiding, we're avoiding words that conjure a framework where people already have a fixed identity in relationship to that framework. So when we use words like left and right or centrist, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, we find that people kind of have a fixed position. It's it's basically one of four places. They either identify as left or right, or they identify in the middle as a centrist, whatever that means, or they identify as increasingly, you know, this is kind of the modal response at the door, is they identify as alienated from the entire framework. And if we start out by conjuring that framework, people tend to feel fixed in relationship and argumentative in relationship to their position in that framework. They're either ident- they're either with you from the left, they're against you from the right, they're against you from the center, or they're they're like don't want to have anything to do with politics um, from the outside. And so it, the point is like lead with the issues. Lead with the issues, lead with values, and pick fights that polarize not on the left right spectrum, but on a bottom versus top spectrum. That's the key to us building and and getting up, you know, finding, making a huge difference in, in voter turnout and in building an organization in an area like Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where there hasn't been something like this before. It's a repolarization. So it's not not polarizing. It's not avoiding fights. It's polarizing the people versus a political elite uh, or an establishment or Wall Street, um, people who have left us behind, who's interests are not our interests. And that's been a popular way of polarizing. You don't get everybody, but you get a lot of people. We got a lot of people to cross over from Republican to vote for Jess King in this election by by framing the fight in that way. And just to pause on that, could you just state how much Trump won that district by and how much you guys lost it by? He won the old district. See, we got redistricting midway through. He won the old district by 26 points. He won the new district by even more than that, but I don't remember the exact number. And then we lost by 18 points. We lost by a considerable amount, but we made up a considerable amount of of time, in, uh, of, of points. We actually, um, we made up in every single precinct in our district, really significantly in some places, you know, some places like Lidditz going from about 25% to 50% of the vote share, Ephrata going from 15% to 40% of the vote share. Those are places where we had a lot stronger of a ground game. Your cousin couldn't have been happy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my cousin is the incumbent. And uh, <laughs> um, I mean, he's happy. He was very happy at redistricting. Um, long and short is uh, the old district would have been a lot closer. Um, we may have won. We may not have won. But we ran a campaign that people said we shouldn't run. Um, the, the local Democratic Party said, uh, we need somebody who wins over Romney voters, which isn't really much of a thing, Romney voters. 
we need somebody who, you know, plays to quote unquote the center. You know, we had a candidate like that in 2016, Christina Hartman, and she underperformed Clinton by 7,000 votes. You know, the Democratic Party wanted to run her again. And, you know, while we respected the effort she made, um, we thought we needed a candidate who actually picked fights with with Wall Street, who fought for working people and who polarized in this bottom versus top uh, way. And so we got behind Jess King and first had to kind of run an insurgency in relationship to the local Democratic Party. You know, we proved able to build the, the largest, probably the, the largest Democratic campaign here in at least 50 years, you know, a thousand active volunteers on the campaign side, plus a really robust uh, independent operation through Lancaster Stands Up. Um, and that's the only, that's likely the largest field operation of any house race in the country. Uh, we don't know of any that would have been bigger. And that's the kind of enthusiasm you can only get by actually picking fights that everyday people recognize. And key to it is picking a fight with the the current leadership of the Democratic Party. That that was absolutely important uh, to, our, to our success. I'm Aziz Rana, and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here, and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast, and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, with a foreword by Angela Davis. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa is an ambitious masterwork of political economy detailing the impact of slavery and colonialism on the history of international capitalism. In this classic book, Rodney makes the unflinching case that African maldevelopment is not a natural feature of geography, but a direct product of imperial extraction from the continent, a practice that continues up into the present. Meticulously researched, how Europe underdeveloped Africa remains a relevant study for understanding the so-called great divergence between Africa and Europe, just as it remains a prescient resource for grasping the multiplication of global inequality today. In this new edition, Angela Davis offers a striking foreword to the book, exploring its lasting contributions to a revolutionary and feminist practice of anti-imperialism. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney with a foreword by Angela Davis. Out now from Verso Books. So just to sort of sum up what we've been talking about, too often on the left, there's been this tendency to paraphrase Brecht that the left has been inclined to want to dissolve the people and elect another. But I think that we're doing so much more people-oriented and more winning-oriented work than ever in the last few years. What you're doing in Lancaster, what Reclaim and other groups did in Philly with DA Larry Krasner getting elected, what DSA and other groups did in New York, getting AOC into office, people are knocking on doors and getting results. Yeah, it's it's very hopeful. It's the most hopeful time in certain regards um, that I've ever lived in from a, from a grassroots organizing perspective. It's also an incredibly dangerous time with the with the rise of authoritarian populism. Yep. And I think it's a race against time in terms of our ability to build a bench of campaigners, of candidates, of organizations that can navigate the political terrain and and gain the um the mantle, gain the 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 momentum. The old guard leadership of the Democratic Party um that's, you know, been hegemonic for the past few decades that uh, you know, really represents the neoliberalism politics, you know, has, you know, woke politics on social issues, but then is, you know, is the party of NAFTA and the party of big money in politics and just takes for granted those constraints in, in politics. They want a return to quote unquote normalcy. They want to uh, defeat Trump with somebody who is like Democrats have been um, for the past few decades. Woke social politics evacuated of any substantive meaning, even of woke social politics, because what does saying like, you know, women of color are great? What does that what does that really signify if the woman of color in question has 
mocked anti-mass incarceration activist insistence that we should prioritize schools over jails. Right, right. So, I mean, that's that Kamala Harris. It shows, I mean, the limits. And and I mean, it's it's so interesting how, you know, this question of Bernie running and it coming down to like him and, yeah, I think Elizabeth Warren to a, to an extent being the only left candidate or candidates just shows the who who you know are in the Senate or who have a path to the presidency just shows how weak our bench is though in challenging um, that leadership. The forces defending the old status quo are very very unlikely to gain the political momentum. Right, we're living in a populist moment where um, where the um, uh, the political status quo is in crisis where people um, don't believe in the political class and there's hunger for something to shake it up. And in moments like that, historically, it is very rare for pro status quo forces to regain the political momentum. Um, And so in my opinion, if a progressive inclusive populism doesn't emerge to challenge the old Democratic Party and the old system, so a, a populism from, quote unquote, the left or from the bottom up, then I think the authoritarianism that Trump represents is likely to be able to continue with the momentum. I think there's a very re- real scenario where Trump could win in 2020. There's also a real scenario where a centrist Dem wins and we think we're in the clear, but we've got hundreds of of young Republicans and young authoritarians who understand the authoritarian playbook now and might not have all the baggage um, and inadequacies that Trump has. I think that's a huge danger. Um, And so we've got to gain that momentum by, by literally by winning, by running campaigns that can win, by uh, fighting on values, translating those values to masses of people and consolidating them uh, in you know, winning office and winning uh, policy. Yeah, I think we just have to look to Macron's experience in France for hard evidence that a radical centrist re-winning power against the populist left and right does not put all of the contradictions that led to the rise of populist left and right movements to rest. Yeah, I think that's right. Before we move move on from this discussion we've been having about how the left should situate itself amongst the people as broadly as we can construe them. One thing I want to clarify is that this isn't the same as a critique of countercultures as a whole or as such. The argument that the left place itself amidst the wider society doesn't mean that the left should be doing some sort of normie cosplay or erasing the many working class people who are proudly queer or juggalos or just plain weirdos. My reading is that we have to situate ourselves within a larger society that is itself diverse and by no means uniformly normative. In in other words, for me, the, the point isn't that leftists shouldn't be involved in subcultures, but rather that leftism itself shouldn't be its own subculture. Do you think that's right? I think that's a good way of putting it, Yes. I think that related to this, there there are different kinds of movements, and you know a lot of the, there, there's in short there's kind of particularistic social movements, um, which are movements of a particular identity, usually an identity that is a minority, though not always. Like women's movements could be uh, seen as a particularistic movement, um, even though women are a slight ma- majority. But it's a movement of a particular group that has its particular grievances and is fighting for its particular rights or inclusion in the polity. And that's one kind of social movement. Then there are also what we might call hegemonic movements or aspiring hegemonic movements, which, um, you know, economic justice or economic populist movements, for example, taking on Wall Street. Banks got bailed out. We got sold out. We are the 99%, which are claiming a supermajority and kind of defining a universal we the people. Both are really important kinds of movements. And there's a tension 
often between the particularistic and the quote unquote universal in movements. And the way that often plays out is that people will say, hey, shut up about Black Lives Matter because that's distracting from the real bread and butter issues that we need to focus on if we're going to win, right? I do not subscribe to that. (laughs) So people will try to silence particularistic grievances and movement demands in order to have a united front. That's the one way. The other negative way that it plays out is some of the particularistic movements will become ambivalent about the need for a broad alignment. And what we really need is both things at once. We need movements that are those particulars, often at the margins, often people who are oppressed. Um, I mean, usually that's like the formula for a social movement, right? Like people who have grievances against the dominant culture and the dominant system fighting for their share and for their inclusion and for their rights. Um, And so we need that, but we also need a broad alignment of a lot of those different forces in a popular narrative, a popular framing of we the people, if any of those particular movements are to make any gains. You make a really important argument along these lines, which is that in this play of competing identities, that a key task of the left, of course, is to hide in class identification, but also acknowledging the importance that people give to other identities, as long, of course, as they aren't like retrograde ones like whiteness. Uh, and, and what you're talking about in the the book, I think really compellingly, is this challenge of creating an identity framework that highlights the common interest without trying to erase actually existing heterogeneity. And that these identities, say race and class, are not even so much that they can be in tension, but not exactly as the way in the way that they sometimes appear at first blush, because oftentimes you write addressing those identities, people's experiences as black or undocumented or incarcerated or queer is a prerequisite to heightening class identities. And that's because identities, class identities are often some of the least apparent to people. And as Stuart Hall put it, race is the modality in which class is lived. And and historically, you write, when class identities are made radically salient, which is one thing we're really after on the left, as they were with the United Farm Workers, they're often brought to life vis-a-vis other identities. In the UFW's case, ethnic ones. And I thought that was really, a really smart point. I mean, what it really boils down to is that, and this, this goes back to the political identity paradox that we started off talking about, is that part a central part of political mobilization is telling a story of a we that the base that you need to accomplish your political ends will see themselves in, will identify with. Um, And to have that story of a we have the kind of political content that you need to put the kind of policy demands and structural demands on the system that you need. You know, there's an interplay between identities that people already identify with, whether it's one's race, religion, geographic community, et cetera, and the kind of broader workers of the world unite, or um, we are the 99% identity. And and the way that those things get intertwined and mess with each other is really complex. And I think that's part of the role of political mobilization and organizers is to engage with that in as strategic a way as possible. I want to turn to your overall argument about the struggle for hegemony. First, we should define hegemony. And second, explain the role that a struggle over hegemony plays in this larger battle for political power. Yeah. So hegemony is, what is it? Predominant influence is like one of the the most standard definitions. I mean, I mean, I take Gramsci's definition of hegemony, which is, you know, complex, but it's core to hegemony is defining the common sense, right? I mean, that's that that's core to cultural hegemony, right? Is that, is the common sense, for example, greed is good, or is it do unto others as you would have them do unto you? And, you know, obviously people live with a lot of contradictions and could subscribe to both of those things at once, but at different moments, uh, different belief systems kind of rise to the level of common sense. I think the we are the 99% frame that Occupy Wall Street ushered in uh, is a really important moment of changing that common sense, 
right? There was no popular mantra of popular class consciousness for a few decades before that. And suddenly it changed. And there's a narrative to make sense of the financial crisis and to make sense of how the political system has been rigged. I'm not saying that Occupy Wall Street all at once achieved cultural hegemony, but that's an important moment in kind of the clash over meanings and common sense that is involved in a, in a, in a hegemonic struggle. But I think that, I mean, I, I talk about in a hegemonic struggle that there's that symbolic aspect, which I just described, and then there's the institutional contest, which is over you know, institutions. How many people do you have in the House of Representatives and the Senate? Um, what's your mobilizing ground game? How many local chapters do you have? What's your organization's membership? How are you navigating political terrain? And those two things, I think, are, I say, conceptually distinct, but actually inseparable in real life. But it's, yeah, it's a fight to both control, to control the rhetorical you know, landscape and to, or, or to influence it predominantly. So ruling class hegemony is the particular interest of the ruling class standing in for the interests of society as a whole. But events like the 2008 economic crisis can provoke a legitimacy crisis, and that in turn can open up a contest over hegemony. But to win, left movements must identify themselves as representatives of the larger whole, just like the ruling class does when it maintains hegemony because that's what a hegemonic formation does. But but Occupy, you write, failed to do so because it represented itself as the whole rather than as an agent acting on behalf of the whole and thus radically limited its potential. You argue that this was driven in part by legitimate fears of co-optation but was more so driven by, quote, the force of individuation itself. Explain what went wrong with Occupy, and you identify a number of things that went wrong with Occupy, but explain what what went wrong with Occupy on this count. Yeah, I think that, um, first of all, you got to name the things Occupy did right, right? It, it, it re, that reframing that I mentioned of we are the 99% was critically important. You know, the financial crisis happened. Nobody was held accountable. There was no opposition party talking about it in a way that satisfied millions of people's grievances against the way that the economic system had left them behind and betrayed them. And um, and so Occupy Wall Street suddenly kind of filled that void. And by persisting and sticking with it for a couple of weeks, it suddenly blew up as a news story um, and became that symbolic uh, defiance of a political system and an economic system that had left most people behind. Because you write, and I just want to quote you here, you write, I think, very poignantly and correctly, everything depends upon the question of who is inside or outside of the circle, who is the us and who is the them. And Occupy did that brilliantly. It did. But then the experience of people on the ground in these occupations is a different thing, right? So, you know, part of the crisis of neoliberalism and of late capitalism is this crisis of community. And I, you know, I cite Habermas in my book, but, you know, he talks about the logics of profit and the logics of bureaucracy kind of colonizing every aspect of our lives, you know, breaking down the social fabric. Um, and uh, so there's this longing that we have for community and we find it in every which pocket, right? We find it in... <laughs> our rugby team or our Sunday school class or our lefty group. And a lot of people found that in Zuccotti Park. And um, the dramatic, you know, mass assemblies of, you know, 400 people doing mic checks is this kind of catharsis and this way of celebrating community. The problem with it is when that sense of community comes to trump any kind of political utility that Occupy Wall Street had. So from my perspective, from the beginning, Occupy Wall Street was important as a symbol of defiance at the doorstep of Wall Street in its ability to catalyze a broader popular movement. You know, the actual occupation at the park may have been a catalyst for that, but the point wasn't to keep that occupation going in perpetuity. But for a lot of participants, that was the point. Which was substituting a tactic not only for strategy, but a tactic for politics. It was exactly. And it was also substituting what you had just described, a small we, 
of the we that was occupying the park physically for the large we of we are the 99%. And so and you had this fight constantly where our opponents, like um, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, were trying to frame Occupy as those crusty hippies who were drumming at two in the morning as this particular, right? And our role, like me and the PR team uh, and other folks, was to continually frame Occupy Wall Street as everybody who identified with the movement, you know, like farmers in Iowa who were sending knit caps to keep us warm um, and people who were ordering us pizza from West Virginia, you know, people who were facing foreclosure. And so that was one of the central fights, uh, the rhetorical fights. And I think that kind of in the DNA of Occupy, it was from the beginning, the predominant ethos was an, was allergic to political power. And so it was it was very hard, even though there were many of us who saw Occupy as the best kind of start of a political vehicle that we had because of its rhetorical intervention um, and naming the problem of a rigged economy of Wall Street, of the billionaire class. But it was not able to kind of become what it needed to become uh, politically. And, you know, that's in some ways disappointing, but in some ways, okay, different movements and different moments play different roles. I think that the Bernie Sanders campaign was the next was the launch of that kind of Occupy Wall Street spirit, but with an electoral campaign that aimed um, to gain electoral power. You have AOC's campaign as another important iteration of that spirit. And so that's where we're at, I think. I completely agree. I think it's important what your book does in terms of analyzing the shortcomings of Occupy, which were many, but I, I never call Occupy a failure and always argue with people about this because because to me the left had to pass through that moment to get to its next stage occupy's role was to fight this symbolic war and now the torch has been passed to us to wage the institutional war like the occupations had to end at some point and occupy for a variety of i think institutionally rooted reasons couldn't be so much different from what it was maybe yeah i think that's right this all circles back to your argument about the left needing to be embedded in local institutions because you write people's relationship to national political identities are mediated through these more concretely lived local identities and solidarities. And this is something that Occupy, with a few important exceptions, largely failed or was unable to do. It did successfully, of course, push this left framework into the national debate, but it did not often ground it in the local organizations and blocks who would have to be mobilized to take the struggle to the next level. Explain a little bit about how that played out in Occupy and how it is that you see the relationship between local organizing and the national political fights and debates. Well, I think even on that, um, it's more complex <clears throat> than the dominant narrative. Like in New York, the biggest days of action, like when we took over Times Square, November 17th, I think, um, the mass mobilization right after the raid, you know, Working Families Party, labor unions, community organizations like ACE really were part of mobilizing those big crowds. Um, a lot of those organizations kind of seconded staff part-time or full-time to occupy um, so there, and then in the foreclosure fights, like especially I'm thinking about Minnesota, Occupy Homes Minnesota, Occupy Homes Atlanta, um, you had the incorporation of local groups into building campaigns that were really rooted in the community. So it wasn't all or nothing with Occupy. I think there were some big successes. However, there was a tendency within Occupy to feel threatened by those community groups, to feel like they were co-opting them. And this kind of purism that that kind of had to have this narrative of that they were inventing this from scratch and that when 50,000 people came out or whatever the number was on November 17th, that that was spontaneous. And that was bullshit. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, those successes were based on existing organizations that had built for the long term. Combined with the unique momentum and the narrative that Occupy had hit on, yes, of course. But so I, I don't think it was all or nothing. I just think we had to go much further in that regard to 
dig into engaging with people as they were instead of thinking that to be part of Occupy Wall Street, you had to show up at Zuccotti Park in person and camp out or to whatever you know occupation was in your town square um, because only so many people are going to be able to do that. Let's turn to the question of leadership. You write that in Occupy, the constant focus on endless general assembly meetings and a commitment to a certain ideal of pure participatory democracy led to actual decision-making being made by leaders in a less public and less democratic way. Those leaders, people like you, existed but weren't acknowledged. How did leadership form and operate in Occupy, and what should we learn from that? I think that there's always leadership in movements, and there's a question of how developed that leadership is, how competent that leadership is, but also, importantly, whether that leadership is formalized or whether it is informal. And Occupy Wall Street had this narrative of leaderlessness as kind of a predominant narrative. And what that did culturally is it made it so that if you were taking leadership, that was bad. And so people would kind of downplay their own leadership in the organization. And it also made it so that because of that, if if leadership is bad and there's skill sets that in reality are you know, it takes to be leaders, that means we're not cultivating new leaders. So we weren't, right? Um, And then it also meant that informal leadership is what actually was happening. So the general assemblies were beautiful in terms of their participation. Hundreds of people would participate, could bring proposals, could, you know, mic check, could be part of this thing, but they were totally a shit show when it came to functional decision-making. And so what happened is you had real decisions having to be made all the time on things like negotiating with the city, negotiating with, you know, getting city council members to push back on the mayor to prevent them from raiding us, all sorts of logistical matters, portageons and food and all those things. And then PR strategy, all these different pieces. And because the General Assembly was the official decision-making apparatus and it was incapable of making decisions in any kind of adequate way, those decisions became, you know, made informally in real time with small pockets of people. And there were a couple of different pockets of leadership. I was part of one. Um, And I was very critical of the system. I thought that we should formalize functional decision-making structures. But short of that, there were important things that had to be decided and that, you know, some of us were part of deciding. So yeah, I I think that's right. I think... um, a better approach to the horizontal spirit that Occupy brought to decision-making would be to have a leaderful movement where we say we need lots of leaders um, and where we need leadership to be clear and structured and accountable. And I think a lot of people drew those lessons. I mean, a lot of people who are involved in Occupy are now have, have led other social movements and have, have, have learned a lot about how leadership is needed and uh, have grown. You also provide concrete advice for how leadership should work. And one thing you write is that leaders have to provide people with things to do. And this might seem like the most obvious thing ever, but it's actually, in my experience, one of the hardest parts of building an organization. And you write that people's involvement needs to be sustainable and that there need to be variable ways that people can plug in at different levels. And not just inviting people to meetings, which can be a major turnoff. You write that Occupy, with, again, some important exceptions, failed to provide a way for people to plug in and do the work necessary to move the movement beyond the initial tactic of occupying. Explain the argument you're making about the division of labor within an organization and the role leadership plays in that. And on the one hand, and on the other hand, growing that organization into an engine of a powerful movement. Yeah, let me give you a concrete example. So Lancaster Stands Up started immediately after the 2016 election. And at first we formed working groups that people could plug into. Um, We had an immigration working group, a healthcare working group. um, And then we had like admin and different uh, things like uh, training. And that was how we tried to plug people in. And um, we were able to plug in quite a few people, but it was very hands-on and it was very, it was, it took a lot of effort to plug people in. When we launched our 
our long-term ongoing canvas and phone bank, it was a total game changer because we created kind of an entry level way of being involved, like a shift, a canvas shift or a phone bank shift that was very structured, gave people a chance to plug in. And what we found is that, you know, some of our intuition is like, oh, we should give people all these options and allow them to kind of chart their own course. And that's how we should plug people in at first. And what we found is that by providing a way for a lot of people to get involved in a very clear and pretty constrained way, right? Very structured way. A lot more people got involved. And then what we found is that some people wanted to do just that, phone bank or Canvas, and they were fine doing a shift once a week or once a month or whatever it is. And then other people wanted to do more. And by having that way for them to get initially involved, very structured, they kind of got a foothold in the organization and then could become more of a leader and develop as a leader and you know innovate and think about how they would do it differently or how they would train. And so I, I'm a big believer in creating pretty structured ways for people to get involved, but then having those who want to get more involved, having those opportunities for them to develop as leaders. I think that's part of what the leadership core of organizations and campaigns have to do is kind of structure that involvement of people who are coming in the door. You have a related lesson about how leaders and organizations should approach people. And that's about the importance of winning people over to taking action, not just on the basis of the morality of the issue being acted upon, but also on the basis of the action's efficacy. It turns out, in other words, that many people don't want to spend their time just bearing noble witness to injustice, but are eager to take action when it feels like it matters. Explain your argument about creating efficacious actions and organizations, and how to then convey that efficacy so that people want to participate. Yeah, we could call this the the underdog who can win dilemma or something like that, right? And and the dilemma is that most of the base, the social base that we um, want to organize and win over are motivated by underdog situations, right? By those without power taking on the powerful. Um, however, they're also demoralized by that situation, by the narrative of you can never fight city hall or, you know, um, you know, the powerful are just too powerful. So the, the, the real trick is to frame underdog, underdogs who can win. And it's not easy, right? Um, and it's partly in narratives, but it's partly in these kind of surprise blows that throw your opponents off. Um, right. Like there being a town meeting, on an issue where nobody ever shows up and suddenly it's packed with 300 people and those in power are thrown off and don't know what to do, right? That's a glimpse of, hey, maybe we could win this. Um, and so there's a real art to this, I think, uh, but that's what it comes down to. It's like framing underdog struggles that can win. And, you know, you see it on the other side. That That is the Trump campaign in a nutshell, right? Trump was the insurgent candidate who took on one coronated candidate after another in the Republican Party. And then the grand prize was the candidate who who symbolized the political establishment for many Americans, Hillary Clinton. It's the underdog who can win narrative. And uh, so it's not just our side that that does this. Um, but that to me is is a big piece. But key to it is that, right, we're not just holding a righteous critique on the sidelines we are indicating that there's some savvy, that there's some possibility that if we all act together collectively in this moment, maybe we can win. Um, And there's different tactics that'll play that role at different times. It might be a mass protest one time, and it might be, it, it could be all sorts of things. It might be a candidate campaign another time. But it's also important to recognize that some of the same candidate tactics that can serve us can also hinder us, right? So a protest can be a demonstration of power, but it can also be a demonstration of powerlessness if our numbers are small and our message is not resonating. So those are the things I kind of keep in mind with that. Well, Jonathan Matthew Smucker, thank you very much. It was fun talking with you. Thanks for having me on. Mm-hmm. 
Jonathan Matthew Smucker is executive director of Beyond the Choir, co-founder of Lancaster Stands Up, and the author of Hegemony How To, A Roadmap for Radicals from AK Press. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said after noting that a class of itself does not a class for itself make, while other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Logan Dreher. Please follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio and find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes, you can also leave us a nice review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. So does spreading the word to your friends. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation running strong. Even a few bucks is huge. Mm-hmm.